Red Eagle Politics. Let's see what you have to say. Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new video. We just hit 33.7k subscribers. Can we get to 34k by the end of the month? Please like this video down below and comment down below before we get started. But today we have to talk about Donald Trump suspending immigration into the United States. He's finally done it. A lot of people have been waiting for him to do this for quite some time now. And actually he's done it, not just necessarily the travel restrictions because of the virus, but for a couple of months, he is going to temporarily suspend immigration into the United States. As he says, in light of the attack from the invisible enemy, as well as the needs to protect jobs of our great American citizens, I will be signing an executive order to temporarily suspend immigration from the United States. That is a good thing in my Of course, it's a good thing in your opinion. It's super cringe in my opinion. Holy shit. Also, this invisible enemy rhetoric. This is one of those situations where I gotta wonder who actually wrote this tweet. Because there's definitely some hallmarks of Trump, the great American citizens. But the invisible enemy rhetoric, I don't think he's smart enough for that, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Ah. Uh, suspending immigration. So, this is funny given how poor immigration has been handled since Trump came to power anyway, but it's also not good. And it's not good for a variety of reasons, because for one thing, immigration is good for the economy. I'll say it again. Immigration is good for the economy. It brings good, new workers into places. It causes people to move around to better spread out skills and economic capabilities. And it brings people in who might be able to help with a different perspective or, or different training, different knowledge. Just go through history and look, through the, look at the number of improvements brought to America by immigrants. And you will understand, even ignoring the economists who will tell you, yeah, immigration is a good thing. It, it boosts the economy. Moreover, this is a hundred percent locking the door after the horse has already gone out, infected all the other horses, burned down your house, and is back in the stable. Not your stable, but a different stable. Also, do you think he was high when he did this? It was on April 20th. 420, baby. Now, Trump is famously, well, <laughs> so Trump is famously not a drinker, but I have seen some evidence that Trump is uh, an abuser of uh, other kinds of drugs. Specifically, bizarrely, a specific type of Sudafed that you can like only get in the UK or some shit that gives you a kind of meth-like high, I guess. But the invisible enemy is rhetoric often used by fascists to refer to people. It's very convenient that he has a plausible reason to use this because, of, of course, a virus is invisible. No one can see it with the naked eye. But it's often used to refer to groups of people who will specifically fight against or who specifically are trying to take down your nation. America, Germany, Italy, whatever nation we're talking about here. Because one of the core pieces of rhetoric that fascists will use is to unite the in-group versus the other. They, they want to otherize anyone who is outside of whatever group the fascists are trying to prop up. This is why fascism is often considered a death cult because the whole basis of their rhetoric is to continue to have an enemy. So this is why fascism is inherently unstable and why I think that any kind of fascist government will eventually fall, but how much damage are they gonna do in the meantime? And the reason why I say that is because if a fascist government succeeds, if they manage to eradicate whatever outgroup they use to get into power, like, say Trump gets his wildest dreams and he manages to completely eradicate 
Muslims, Mexicans, anyone he doesn't consider white. How is he going to maintain power? You think he's going to be able to maintain power with, hey, look at how awesome I, I made things by eliminating all the brown people. Because eventually, the same issues that he came to power to solve are going to come back. Because the issue is not the people, it's the system. The antagonisms of capitalism are what he's railing against, even though he doesn't, he may not realize it. So then what does he do? Well, <laughs> then Irish and Italian people will no longer be considered white. Or uh, maybe they'll, they'll choose some other thing to stop the to, to, to other. And once they've eradicated that person and the same issues come back, what happens? They, they, ha they have to keep going until finally it, they have so narrowly defined the in-group and so broadly defined the outgroup that it's literally just Trump and his family. So this is why fascism is a death cult. And why, why I don't think it can ultimately succeed, but it can still do a lot of damage in the meantime. My opinion, definitely you have this virus, you necessarily have a bunch of workers who are going to be out of work. You don't necessarily need to have all these other people coming in and taking these jobs away from rightfully American citizens. It's funny you hear people talking. The problem is not that people aren't able to fill the jobs, it's that the jobs aren't needed. That's why people are being fired or laid off or furloughed or whatever. This would be like complaining about the lack of ice at the North Pole. Like, seriously, if you're at the North Pole and you want to have a nice, cool drink, you're like, why isn't there any ice? Just go out and get some fucking snow, dude. Like, the issue is not immigrants taking people's jobs. The issue is businesses that have to shut down because they literally can't operate, either because they rely on having people clustered together or because they, were, they rely on interacting with the public, which is a danger to the employees. ...about, oh, um, immigrants do the jobs Americans don't necessarily want to do, but is that necessarily true? Is that really true? We have a lot of American citizens who are out of work. I think that they would be willing to get back into those jobs rather than have foreigners come. And it's not just the low-skilled jobs. It's also things like H-1B skilled work visas, lowering down wages in STEM fields. It's things like construction jobs. And any basically immigrant profession you see, it's just the corporations use immigration to drive down wages. That's why the neocons in the conservative movement have been supporting mass numbers of legal immigration for years and years on end now. And what you've had since the 60s is so this is true that under capitalism, immigrants typically get paid less than native workers. There are obviously exceptions, and the H-1B visas are a definite exception to this. But again, if we have proper social safety nets in place, there's no harm to the economy by these people coming in. And that's not the issue right now. Immigrants aren't coming into America to get the jobs that immigrants normally get because they don't want to catch corona. Mexico is handling COVID better than we are. Democrats trying to open up the southern border as well as borders in other countries because they basically do it for power. If you look at the electoral map here, what you can see here is the future of American elections if you keep the immigration rates where they are. That's why I said Donald Trump should make this permanent. Because what you have here is you have mass immigration pouring into the country and places like... I hate this argument that if we allow mass immigration, they're all just going to vote Democrat. That's just not true. Moreover, it's not because they're specifically importing Democrats or anything dumb like that. It's because the Democrats at least make the mouth sounds that the immigrants want to hear. Meanwhile, the Republicans are busy vilifying immigrants and calling them degenerate people from shithole countries. If you don't like the way immigrants are responding to your rhetoric, change your rhetoric. Don't ban the immigrants. Because immigrants are a net good for our economy and for our country. Think about it. What is white people music? Like, as an example, what is white people music? Is it country music? I would say so. And while... 
There is some good country music. I think the best country music is when it's mixed with a little bit of rock and roll. I'm talking about like rebel country, like Waylon Jennings, Hank Jr., artists like that, who take this black-inspired rock music and mix it with country. Same with a rap and hip-hop, which has been incredibly popular and influential over the last 30 years, at least in America. Where did that come from? African immigrants. I mean, forced immigration, but... And even country music has some roots in old Negro spirituals. So this idea that immigrants don't bring anything into the country, that they just take, is completely ahistorical. Like Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, they're going to be gone forever, and Republicans are only going to be able to win 213 electoral votes until they can't win anymore. The Democrats want mass immigration, not because they care so much about immigrants, but because they actually want to keep power. That's basically. Can it be both? Can it be both that they want power as a political party and they want to bring people in to create a better life? I'm not saying everything good in American history has come from immigrants, but most of the good things that we enjoy, maybe not most, maybe that's a bit too far, but a lot of the things people enjoy came from immigrants or came from people who are not native. Like they may be second or third generation, but they're incorporating things from their home country, their home culture into America. What, what happened to the melting pot? What happened to America being the, the place where different cultures and people came together to create a better, stronger whole? What happened to that? Well, realized that, well, you lose a lot of control when you allow that kind of mixture. And if there's anything politicians hate, it's losing control. Basically why you've had Nancy Pelosi advocate for things like sanctuary cities and things like that and do very little to take care of their districts as a result. So basically what you have here is a power grab. And if you technically look at this right here is they also don't want assimilation to happen because Hispanics can vote Republican, but typically it takes three or four generations for that to happen. For example, Donald Trump won fourth generation Hispanics that only spoke English. However, Hillary Clinton won bilingual or Spanish voters by an 80 to 11 margin. The English speaking Hispanic voters actually voted for Hillary by seven percentage points, according to this poll uh, that you can see here. So basically it's about assimilation too. They don't want to force assimilation either. It's part of their neoliberal power grab. And basically it's about power. You have yeah, I feel like assimilation is used often to represent whether someone has integrated. See, I, I prefer integration rather than assimilation, because with integration, you are still maintaining your individuality, your individual culture and history and what is important to you, even generations down the line. But you have integrated that into the American society, and we see this in a lot of minority communities, like a lot of Mexican communities in America, Hispanic communities, I, be, I guess I should say, still maintain a lot of the same culture and traditions of their home country, but they still are integrated into America. They still have mostly American values. They may have a more, inf more emphasis on certain other values. But these minority communities don't necessarily assimilate. They don't become white bread Americans. They become Hispanic Americans, African Americans, uh, Asian Americans. They take what's good about their old culture, their old country, and what they like about American culture and American country and put them together. This is a good thing. And again, if immigrants don't like your rhetoric, don't blame the immigrants, change your rhetoric. That's hip, that's politics 101, my dude. The, the neocon corporate class that we talk about a lot, and they're trying to increase the number of illegal aliens. That's why you had people like Charlie Kirk talk about bringing in 50 million illegals over a 10-year period, all to sudden to change his tune all of a sudden after people actually confronted him on the issue. But you have this donor class. 
Yeah, because Corporate Inc. lost to the Groypers. And if those words mean nothing to you, I envy you. ...class in the Beltway Conservative Inc. that just wants to pour immigrants into the country for their own personal gain, and it's going to screw over the future of the Republican Party. And I've had a lot of people come up to me and cut, hit my DMs and say, well, you, you can't support this. This isn't right. And I say, I don't care. Look, the Democrats are doing what they're doing for a power grab. They want all these people here. They're not going to vote Republican based on you being so nice and warm about immigration. That's what Reagan tried and what happened the second time around when he he ran for re-election. He won by a much greater margin, but his Hispanic vote share actually declined against somebody who was arguably to the right of him on immigration on Mondale. So if you look at this map and you look at what the Democrats are going to have in the future, you're just going to have to ask yourselves, why? And you did it to yourself. So if you're going to keep voting for neocon people, if you're going to keep voting for the Nikki Haley, Dan Crenshaw, um, type of people, this is what you're going to get. Donald Trump is in the middle, arguably, of the spectrum. He's a good president. We can do better in the future. I, th I hope we do better in the future. Oh, okay, I'm pretty sure this dude's a Nazi. <laughs> like, I, I wasn't, I, I thought he was just a far-right, you know, Trumpist, but about the only people who've been like, Trump's okay, but he could be better, I hear from people on the right, are people who generally think he's cucked by Israel because they believe in the Jewish question. So, yeah, that's fun in terms of immigration because it's true. It is an economic drain. Don't listen to anybody that tells you that immigration is not an economic drain. It is economically beneficial to the upper class and to the foreign workers. It is not beneficial to the lower middle class, working class Americans, particularly... Nope. Sorry, you're wrong. So the National Bureau of Economic Research paper on the effects immigration has on wages in the United States study contends previous analyses on the relationship between immigration and wages falsely assumed perfect labor substitutability within immigrants and native workers of similar education levels distorting results. Research shows average American wages rises due to immigration, both short term and long term. Only native demographic whose wages drop are high school dropouts who suffer a decrease in wages of approximately 2% short term, alleviating to 1.1% over time. So high school dropouts who are already a minority and already economically disadvantaged do suffer a very minor wage hit. And it does severely impact wages of prior immigrants, suggesting lack of substitutability with natives. So this idea that immigrants come in and take over the jobs that low-skilled or unskilled native people, native-born people do, is not borne out in the data. It seems to indicate that new immigrants come in and take the jobs that older immigrants were doing. Overall, vast majority of work, American workers' wages increase from immigration. High school dropouts, less than 10% of population, experience a slight decrease which alleviates with time, and there's evidence that immigration may increase native high school graduation rates too. Actually, that's... Using a state ba panel based on census data from 1940 to 2010, I examined the impact of immigration on the high school completion of natives in the United States. Immigrant children could compete for schooling resources with native children, lowering the return to native children and discouraging native high school completion. Conversely, native children might be encouraged to complete high school in order to avoid competing with immigrant high school dropouts in the labor market. I find evidence that both channels are operative and that the net effect is positive, particularly for native-born blacks, though not for native-born Hispanics. An increase of one percentage point in the share of immigrants in the population aged 11 to 64 increases the probability that natives aged 11 to 17 eventually complete 12 years of schooling by 0.3 percentage points and increases the probability for native-born blacks by 0.4 percentage points. I account for the endogeneity of immigrant flows by using instruments based on 1940 settlement patterns. <laughs> so I would have to read this whole document to this 57-page document, which no one wants to listen to me read and I don't want to read right now. But I'm from from that abstract, it kind of seems like, hey, you don't want to end up like one of those migrant workers working for peanuts, do you? Stay in school. 
that racism helps people stay in school and complete at least high school. That's funny. So, yeah. So, Red Eagle Politics is, once again, completely wrong. Immigration helps all spectrums of the worker, of the economy, with the exception of a teeny tiny little impact on the lowest skilled high school dropout workers. I mean, to be perfectly honest, if that's the case, and that's what all economists are saying, then I would say that stopping immigration when our economy is already flailing is probably only going to hasten its collapse further. So maybe Trump's been a secret socialist accelerationist all along. Crazy. The legal Latino citizens that were born in America as well as African Americans. If you look at what they did in Mississippi when they raided the meatpacking plant, the workforce went from 80% illegal Latino um, workforce to roughly 80% black, and this is what happens. So you do have American citizens that actually are willing to take the jobs, and most of those jobs actually employ American citizens in them anyway. So I don't like to hear that argument. Um, by the way, speaking of which, if you look at things like welfare, Good thing no one's actually really using that as an argument against immigration. Or an argument for immigration. The argument that immigrants are there to take the jobs Americans don't want. It's a spurious argument. Legal aliens and legal immigrants as well are much bigger drains on the American welfare system than Americans. Why do we... You know how you solve that? Amnesty. Make them all citizens. If you're in America, you're a citizen. You pay taxes, you get the benefits. We, at the point of a crisis, need to take in more immigrants now than what we necessarily could have. We, we need to take care of our citizens first. We need to put Americans first. We need a more populist platform. We've been putting every country before our own. For I agree. More populism. Left populism. No right populism. Only left. For years upon years upon years upon years, and every other country is willing to put their citizens first, but apparently America is the only country that isn't able to do it. I don't like that. I don't like that train of thought, honestly, and I really do believe that we need to put Americans first. If you look at this graph right here, most immigrants actually take more in welfare right here than... Okay, what is this graph? Household welfare consumption in 2012 tended to be higher among immigrants from Latin America and lower among immigrants from Europe and Asia. Survey of income and program participation covering calendar year 2012, along with federal budget data. Households are classified by the nativity of the household head. Individual countries are not identified in the source data. This is another tactic I've seen a lot of, especially conservatives use, where they use the term welfare. Now I ask you, what is welfare? What does it mean when someone says they're on welfare? Or that we need to make sure we fund welfare or defund welfare? I'm going to let you in on a dirty little secret that I know that the conservatives don't want you to know, and I'll bet the Democrats probably don't want you to either. The liberals don't. There is no welfare. Welfare is a term, an umbrella term, that is used to refer to a variety of programs that are designed to help people in need. These are programs such as unemployment, which again, this was 2012. We were still recovering from the Great Recession. This is food assistance, which people who are working can require. In fact, that's one of the biggest issues with giant corporations like Walmart and Amazon is that they will often essentially subsidize their employees and paying their employees by paying them such low wages that they still qualify for food assistance. The wealthiest nation in the world, one of the wealthiest corporations, if not the wealthiest corporation in the world, either Amazon or Walmart, one of the two is probably at the top. Certainly the largest employer in America, Walmart, there was something, let me see if I can find it real quick. Here it is. 
So look at this. Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Montana, and Colorado, or excuse me, Wyoming. The biggest employers in those states is Walmart. And yet the people working in those states are making pennies, relatively speaking. So these very well could be working people who nonetheless have to receive additional assistance, either because they're single parents, because they work for a job that doesn't provide enough income so they get additional assistance. They could be underemployed for a variety of reasons. They could be receiving disability and still working or just legitimately unable to work. There's a variety of reasons why these people could be on welfare. And there's no reason to assume that just because they're from Central America and Mexico that they're lazy and don't want to work so they just get welfare. Fuck off with that racist bullshit. All this shows is that native-born Americans tend to not need assistance or tend to not qualify for it. That's literally all this graph shows. Native citizens do. That's a problem. We don't need to be putting people into America that aren't self-sufficient. Um, if you look at this graph here, immigrant households use more in welfare than native households, even illegals, because they use the fake Social Security numbers. And See, this has got it broken down. So the immigrant households cost a little bit more in cash. They cost quite a bit more in, in food and Medicaid. But again, immigrants tend to be underemployed. They, they tend not to have the same opportunities that native born workers will have. There's a lot of reasons why they might receive this assistance and none of them is because they won't work. None of them is because they refuse to work or, or, or anything stupid like that. They receive this assistance because they need it, because maybe they've fallen on hard times or whatever. They, they could be on disability, they could be... There could be a variety of reasons why they are on welfare. But the obvious assumption and implication of this person's video, of him using these graphs, is that, oh, immigrants are just here to take and take and take. And then somehow you'll have the um, people like AOC go on Twitter and try to defend how illegals aren't able to get their stimulus checks. It's, it's a total, total disaster. So right now you have this map. Yeah, did you see that as well? Um, let me... Yeah. Americans married to immigrants might not qualify for stimulus checks. Hey, hey, hey. I'm the only one who gets to make noise right now. The stimulus payments now hitting bank accounts are designed to help most Americans weather the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus pandemic, but some people are excluded from the payments, including some U.S. citizens who are married to immigrants. The government's $2.2 trillion economic relief package excludes several groups from the payments, which amounts to $2,400 for married couples earning less than $150,000. Among those are non-resident aliens, meaning immigrants without green cards. But the IRS now says that American citizens who are married to immigrants without social security numbers are also blocked from receiving the payments. About 1.2 million immigrants are married to U.S. citizens, according to the Migration Policy Institute. The IRS says that only married couples in which both parents have valid, both partners have valid social security numbers will receive stimulus checks. That effectively excludes legal immigrants who use an individual taxpayer identification number to file taxes. These are not the illegal immigrants, these are not people who are here illegally. These are people who are married to U.S. citizens, but for whatever reason have not pursued full citizenship, either because they can't afford it, they're not interested, or whatever. It doesn't matter. The native person is disqualified because they're married to an immigrant. This is very important. This goes to Trump's fascist rhetoric. His otherization of the immigrants, of people who are different from him. So again, just because immigrants tend to use more welfare than native households doesn't mean they're lazy, that they don't want to work or anything like that, or more importantly, that they're not contributing to the economy and you have these graphs and you see what the detriments of immigration do to America. And you just have to say it's so good that Donald Trump finally put his foot down and stood for something for once and actually enforced a...
stood for something for once. He had the longest shutdown of the government in history, if I recall, over his fucking border wall. Ban on immigration, it's temporary. It probably will go through the court system. This is true. However, constitutionally, the Supreme Court and all the other judges, there's really nothing that they can do to stop this, especially because Donald Trump has actually flipped so many circuits and put real judges, real judges that actually want to uphold the Constitution on those benches. So that's a very good thing. So honestly, in the long-term scheme of things, this is probably going to hold. And honestly, at the end of 60 days or 90 days or whenever it ends, Trump's probably going to have to extend it, and he probably should extend it into the end of his term. And honestly, I think it's going to help him significantly if he actually would like to carry this through his next term, if he actually has four more years of no immigration. Please, please do not give Trump another four years. I know it hurts, but vote for Biden. I'm going to say it every day if I have to. I'm sorry. We need to get Trump out of office. I know that's the same lib argument that you hear from the blue checks on Twitter and from shit libs who were shit talking Bernie, but we have to get Trump out of office. We cannot give him another four years. We cannot give him that kind of mandate. You think he was bad now? Imagine Trump with the gloves off. Imagine Trump elected to another four years having already defeated an, Im an impeachment, having already proven that no one is going to hold him accountable for the shit he did, having already proved that apparently a majority of people in key places in America want Donald Trump. You think he's bad now? Give him that. Give him that power. He'll never leave. Basically, you can keep your country together. You can keep your culture together. You can basically keep your wages together because that's another big thing, immigration and wages. If you look at the study done by George J. Borjas, the working class has absolutely been decimated due to immigration. This is actually why true revolutionaries like Cesar Chavez would actually go down to the border with his crew and actually pelt um, people crossing it with eggs. I do not endorse that, but... Um, Apparently, my position. Hmm, Cesar Chavez. The name rings a bell, but I can't remember. Hmm. Let's see. Let's do some looking here. Labor leader, community organizer, and Latino American civil rights activist. Okay, seems pretty based so far. National Farm Workers Association, which later merged to become the United Farm Workers Union. Uh, with Roman Catholic social teachings. Okay. There's actually a significant history of Christian anarchy and Christian socialism. So uh, it's actually kind of funny given how leftists and so-called progressives are often anti-religion, anti-theist, anti-church. But let's just say that I think if Jesus Christ were brought today and somehow taught English... He would have more in common with Bernie Sanders than Donald Trump. But let me... Okay. The UFW during Chavez's tenure was committed to restricting import of immigrant labor. On a few occasions, concern that illegal immigrant labor would undermine UFW strike campaigns led to a number of controversial events, which the UFW describes as anti-strike-breaking events, but which have also been interpreted as being anti-immigrant. In 1969, Chavez and members of the UFW marched through Imperial and Coachella Valleys to the border of Mexico to protest growers' use of illegal immigrants as strike-breakers. Okay. Joining him on the march were Reverend Al Ralph Abernathy and U.S. Senator Walter Mondale. In its early years, the UFW and Chavez went so far as to report illegal immigrants who served as strike-breaking replacement workers, as well as those who refused to unionize. Okay, so this is someone who believes in labor, but is trying in many bad ways to prevent capital from utilizing immigrants against them. That's not great. It's not a good thing what he did, but especially given that the research I showed about immigration being helpful is fairly recent research. There's definitely been this idea that immigration hurts research. And especially someone involved in labor organization, I can 100% understand why he would be against the idea of 
labor organization uh, against immigration because immigrants were often used to replace striking workers, particularly in the farming industry. This is still true today. This is actually one of the major issues that the labor organization had in the early 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and on really until the, the, the civil rights movement in the 60s, was that many unions refused to allow black people to join. So black people would often serve as scabs because why should I refuse to work because a union tells me not to when they won't even let me join the union? So, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with all of his rhetoric or his actions, but I definitely can understand why he would take the actions he did to prevent immigrants from coming into America, given that he had seen how they were used by capital to undermine and weaken the labor movement. There are other ways to do it. Community outreach, mutual aid, empathy. Instead of just reporting the immigrants who are there illegally and working against the union, try to educate them, get them involved in the union so that they can benefit from it and are less likely to break the strike. Position is considered to be too extreme or alt-right, but apparently Cesar Chavez, who is a total revolutionary workers hero and a Latino, apparently he gets a, he gets a free pass for some reason. Because he wasn't doing it out of racism, he was doing it to prevent capital from undermining the labor. I just want to make sure that was clear because he's clearly, again, plenty of common tactics with fascists here, rewriting the events, uh, the, the actions someone took in the past in order to create the narrative you want to create. Cesar Chavez was, some, was an activist who threw eggs at immigrants, so he must, have been, he must have hated immigrants as much as we do. No. It's not that he hated immigrants the way Red Eagle politics and his ilk do. It was that he didn't want the immigrants to come in and undermine his organization efforts. There are other ways, better ways to do it, but he did what he thought was best. And I'll say it, he was wrong. Um, but the bottom line is it's historically been a fact that if you increase the supply of workers, you will decrease the wages. That's what's going to happen during this crisis, especially. It's a good Do I even need to point out that this is not, this may be an historical fact, but it's not borne out in data. This is a, an historical fact in the same way that all native Indians in America were savage beasts is an historical fact because that was the belief in history data doesn't bear it out and in 2020 we have to go by data we can't go by what the history books say unless we're talking about a specific historical instant incident Good thing either way, if it gets extended permanently or not, it's a good thing either way that Donald Trump finally put his foot down and was able to stop this, basically, because finally he did something that was important on immigration. Obviously, you've got the wall coming up, you've got hundreds of miles of wall, but this just took his presidency from arguably a, a B grade to an A minus to a solid A, and hopefully he can continue doing this, because if you look at this electoral map right here, and you see this is our future, where you cannot win I mean, a blue Texas is possible. I don't, I don't know about North Carolina. Florida, uh, maybe. May, may, maybe as the boomers die off. But again, we don't want to bring immigrants in just because they tend to vote Democrat. They tend to vote Democrat because at least the mouth sounds the Democrats make are the ones that the immigrants want to hear an election. You lost your country due to uncontrolled immigration at the sake of a donor class who just wants to increase their GDP, who doesn't care about their workers. Well, I'm sorry, that's technically a problem and the conservatives need to do something about this. And honestly, if you really want to win Hispanic voters over, you do it by reaching out to them economically, uh, talking about actual economic populism. Look at what Tucker Carlson talks about don't uh, do not do this nonsense Charlie Kirk, neocon, uh, Mo Leadership Summit stuff because it doesn't work. Either way, it's not necessarily a good thing in terms of immigration. We have to stop it, and Donald Trump took a big step 
in the right direction. Hopefully now people like Pete DeBroska, people like Jerome Bell, um, good congressional candidates that have kind of gotten cast aside can basically be seen in a more serious light because it is an issue that a lot of Americans care about and the left's going to whine like babies about it. But there's really nothing they can do. It's kind of hypocritical for them to say, oh, Trump needs to secure America during this crisis and then say, oh, Trump is racist for not wanting immigrants to come into the country where we have uh, 300 million citizens coming off a big crisis that needs to be taken care of. So anyways, guys, we're not coming off a big crisis. We're in the middle of it. Just because Trump has closed the border and disallowed immigration doesn't mean that he stopped it. He's just made it harder. And I really hope that it doesn't catch on because the only thing worse than a capitalist hell state is a fascist one. Because one of the things I'm afraid of is a powerful Nazbol coming forward and tainting leftist rhetoric for generations. Then we ground under the boot of fascists and capitalists for hundreds of years and we'll never see a free society. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment. Thank you. See you next time.